It is always a pleasure to welcome to the program Glenn Greenwald. He blogs at uh, well at Salon.com, but uh, moving over to the Guardian UK, author of a multiple best-selling New York Times uh, bestseller books. Uh, welcome to the program, Glenn. Thank you, Sam. Good to be here. The intros are not always so easy. <laughs> I do this sometimes, and and I know you're it, it's you can stumble over yourself, but I'm Indeed. ready. But that's part of my charm. Be that as it may, um, I, 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 you wrote a piece the other day at uh, Salon, Extremism Normalized. It's, um, it's a great piece, and it really sort of tracks what is, it seems has happened, really. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe this is eternal, but uh, it certainly has been a, uh, the, the, the pace of this seems to have increased over the years. Um, you start with the just the example of the Patriot Act. Well, just tell us the overall uh, idea here. Well, the reason the Patriot Act is such a potent example illustrating this dynamic is because if you go back and read contemporaneous accounts from 2001 and 2002, when the Patriot Act was first enacted, what is so striking about it is that this was the period when basically everybody was on board with anything the government wanted to do because we were right in the aftermath of the post-9-11 trauma. And even in that height period of, of supremely heightened fear and hysteria and sort of acquiescence to government authority, the Patriot Act was extremely controversial. I mean, in mainstream circles, not just, you know, the ACLU and, and the usual um, civil libertarian objectors, but in mainstream media circles and even within prominent, you know, political circles, you heard all kinds of alarmist rhetoric uh, issuing about the Patriot Act. It sort of became the symbolic face of Bush Cheney radicalism. It was, you know, kind of the warning bells that we might overreact to 9 11 by becoming too authoritarian, by eliminating and eroding the freedoms um, that we've long taken for granted. It was a very draconian piece of legislation that vested the government with all sorts of unprecedented powers of surveillance and detention. It got rid of safeguards that had existed for decades against abuse. Um, and it was enacted very hastily, and, and barely anybody even knew what it said when they voted on it. It was really the kind of um, law that that was held up as, as the sort of thing that was just extremism unleashed. And yet here we are, more than a decade removed from 9-11, um, and the Patriot Act, you know, one of the things that happened when the Patriot Act was enacted was there was a, a provision put into it that said, look, we know what we're doing here is extremist and radical and a departure from how we typically operate as a government, but we think it's justified by the crisis of 9-11. So, but we want you to know this isn't going to be a permanent change. We're putting in a sunset provision that says this law will expire in four years unless it's renewed. So even then people knew um, that it was an extremist piece of legislation. And what has happened is that every four years, um, this law has been renewed um, without any controversy any longer. I mean, the votes in the Congress are something like 90 to 10. Both parties are fully on board with their renewal. Both presidential administrations, so Bush and now Obama, um, demand its renewal without any reforms. And, and this is true even though there's all kinds of evidence that the powers of the Patriot Act have been abused in exactly the way that the original Warner's feared it would. Um, and, and now the Patriot Act is just something that never gets discussed anymore. It's not considered controversial. It's just blended in to our political um, culture. It's just something we now take for granted. And this to me shows how what is at one time a radical act um, and viewed as extremism um, ultimately becomes just normalized by lasting long enough and then just sort of blending into the woodwork. Let's uh, let, let's talk, because I want to talk about the general um because uh, I, I have some questions about that, uh, that the, how, how narrow, uh, I mean, that, that phenomena seems to sort of cut across a lot of different areas. But um, let's also just, I want to talk about the McCain uh, quote, too, because uh, that, that really is stunning. Um, Dick Cheney uh, criticized uh, McCain for having chosen Palin as his running mate. And McCain came back, look, I respect the vice president. He and I had strong disagreements as to whether we should torture people or not. I don't think we should have. This is stunning on a bunch of different levels. I mean, aside and putting aside from the fact that McCain really should have had a little asterisk there saying, like, 
I don't think that we should have allowed the military to torture. Uh, the CIA, I still allow for the CIA oh, right. uh, to torture, uh, but uh, I don't think we should have had it. it, it should, torture should be reserved for the spooks as opposed to our military personnel. But uh, the implications of this are pretty stunning. Uh, just break it down for us. Uh, McCain is basically saying, well, this guy's a torturer, but he's still okay in my book. Right. I mean, he, he, he's ba obviously, you know, McCain is sort of a hot-headed kind of guy. He doesn't react well to criticism. He's never, you know, liked Dick Cheney, at least for a long time, going back to criticisms that McCain voiced over Iraq. And, of course, McCain was resentful at George Bush for a long time at, at, for what Bush did in, in, in the 2000 primary. Um, so there's a feud here, and, and obviously McCain is really trying to sort of jab Cheney with this kind of piercing insult by calling him a torturer. So far, so good. That is what Cheney is. Um, and and, and the, the way that he prefaced it, which is by saying, look, I respect Dick Cheney. You know, obviously, um, this is a way that, you know, political elites and all kinds of other people preface insult. It's this insincere expression of respect. You know, it's like saying with all due respect – you know, you're a repulsive thief and, and you know, a, a heinous human being. Um, it obviously I, to be honest, I, I mean, To be fair, I think I tweeted someone something like that today. So uh, I, I use <laughs> right. that rhetorically. That right. So, I, you know, I get what it's saying. At the same time, you know, this idea of prefacing these kind of remarks of saying, I respect Dick Cheney, even though it's insincere, it's what it really is, is it's it's a it's a kind of ritualistic acknowledgement that the person you're about to criticize is within the realm of political mainstream acceptability. So, you know, not everybody gets this insincere expression. If John McCain stood up on the floor and wanted to denounce, you know, Bradley Manning or Julian Assange, for example, or, you know, Assad, um, he wouldn't stand up and say, you know, with all due respect and then go to criticize them because those are not people within the realm of accepted mainstream um, power factions in Washington. And so even though it wasn't a sincere expression of respect, it still struck me as unbelievable um, that he was essentially in one breath calling Dick Cheney a torturer, but in the other saying, I still recognize and give him the respect um, of somebody who is and should be within um, the, the the circle of, of what is a serious political figure. Um, and that, to me, was just so unbelievable that you could call somebody a torturer, which is what McCain did and what used to be probably the most you know, sort of um, extreme insult you could you could cast at somebody and at the same time say, you know, but at the same time they are, you know, still one of us, a member of good standing of the Washington class. And, and this shows how torture has sort of, you know, just like the Patriot Act, it used to be that it was the ultimate Western taboo and it has now become – just a standard garden variety political disagreement. So you disagree with somebody on torture. Well, that's, it I doesn't mean, mean they're cast out of respectability. That I mean, then that's the ultimate point. It's not even so much his rhetorical flourish as it is the fact that, like, hey, uh, you've just uh, you've just sort of announced that there's a torturer in our midst. Why haven't you done anything about it? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's yeah, just like saying, why, you know, why, why, why aren't you uh, why aren't you calling for his imprisonment? Right. Um, exactly. You know, I, I mean, mean, torture is a war crime. It uh, Glenn. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I lost you there for a minute. So uh, torture is a, is, is a war crime indeed. And what and, and also, why isn't there sort of a, a, bra a greater reaction in the press? Because you do have a uh, John McCain is, is basically publicly calling uh, Dick Cheney a criminal. And what, what what is amazing is that we don't the press doesn't make any issue of it. I mean, it's all just about this rhetorical flourish. You've got this guy, John McCain, who goes on to, who's important enough, apparently, to um, be the uh, the only guest who's allowed on uh, uh, weekend television, you know, on these news shows uh, uh, three out of four weeks of the month. And the fact that he has now basically said that uh, Dick Cheney was torturing, eh, and now we just move on. And I guess that's 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 the point of the example. Right. And, and they're related examples. I mean, I remember, you know, back in 2010, the White House proudly announced that President Obama had met with Condoleezza Rice to get her advice on a variety of national security issues. Um, and the White House likes to do these things because it shows they're bipartisan and the like. Um, and yet, you know, ABC News and other outlets confirm that Condoleezza Rice is the person who presents Decided over the meetings in the White House in which the torture regime was choreographed. So, um, 
so uh, we got interrupted uh, with some technical problems here, uh, and but uh, essentially the the point is is that ultimately is that particularly on this. Um, well, let's also let's let's give one more example, and and this is uh, the the total information awareness program versus what has been recently launched uh, by the New York uh, Police Department, the, do the Domain Awareness System. Now, I remember this Total Information Awareness Program. It was TIPS, it was called at the time, right? Right. So it was TIPS at the time, and when this was introduced, which I think was around 2002, it was completely, completely, uh, there was a huge outcry about it. And now uh, you mentioned that the, the New York Police Department is launching something similar and nothing. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is I think a lot of people forgot what the Total Information Awareness Program was all about. Um, but here again, you know, this is something that was proposed in late 2002, early 2003. Again, when we were very close to the peak of our post-9-11 hysteria and willingness to vest sort of whatever power the government wanted. Um, and yet this is a program they kind of dredged up uh, John Poindexter from wherever Washington sewers he was sort of swimming around, you know, kind of like the defense. Oh, that in uh, Iran Contra figure, the former admiral, to oversee what was intended to be this sort of comprehensive, all seeing surveillance program um, that was going to basically collect all forms of electronic data on American citizens and create this what he called all seeing eye that would be able basically to engage in a real time surveillance of pretty much everybody. So you go to the bank, it records that. You go, they got a uh, money from the ATM machine. It records that. You call your mother. It records that. You call somebody else. You email somebody. Everything gets recorded in this all-seeing comprehensive surveillance system. And even for that period of time, this was just too invasive, too um, extreme. And and Congress actually refused to fund it. The controversy caused the program to end. And yet now we have the New York Department explicitly boasting about the fact that they are creating what they're now calling an all-seeing surveillance program aimed at what they call criminals and potential terrorists, whatever that means. I don't know what a potential terrorist is. It sounds like it's basically anybody. Um, and there's very little controversy over this, even though the language of it and, and the, the substance of it is, is the same. Yeah, I mean, it's stunning. I, I, you know, I hadn't even heard about it uh, but for your mention, and I followed up on the link, and it, it reads literally like, almost like a, uh, just a, it, it reads almost like a, you know, a story you would see in Fast Inc. or whatever it is, uh, after saying <laughs> domain awareness system combines several streams of information to attract both criminals and potential terrorists. New York Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly says the city developed the software with Microsoft. I mean, it just, it, 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 I mean, you know, you, you would imagine that, uh, that, that Microsoft would be a little bit nervous about like, oh, we're, we're enabling this, uh, this thing. Let's just leave our names out of the uh, press releases and all the press, but no, it just sounds like this is a great, uh, we've just developed a great database management system, uh, that we're hoping we'll be able to, uh, I mean, it, it, it is, it is so, um, there, there doesn't even to be a perception of why this might be controversial at this point. Well, what, what's really interesting, Sam, is, you know, think about, you know, sort of standard dystopian science fiction novels that depict this kind of unimaginable tyranny. I mean, one of the most, you know, sort of the well-known and the kind of classic um, example of that genre is 1984 and what made 19, the, the tyranny of 1984 so frightening and, and, and terrifying was that there were monitors in every person's home constantly monitoring and recording and surveilling what every private citizen was doing. There was basically no activity beyond the reach of government's prying eyes. That was the principle that made it so so alarming. Um, or if you look at what, you know, in, in sort of the real world, Americans have always viewed as kind of the um, expression, the, the most extreme expression of tyrannical terror, it would be the East German Stasi, which was the intelligence service, domestic intelligence service, that had files on almost every single citizen constantly recording what they were doing, whether there was evidence of their guilt or not. I mean, this principle that the government shouldn't be collecting information on us, let alone knowing virtually everything that we're doing, unless there's evidence that we're actually engaged in criminal activity that a court says 
justify surveillance. I mean, that was the core principle embedded into the Constitution. That's what the Fourth Amendment is about in terms of requiring search warrants from a court that finds probable cause, and yet we've completely abandoned that. We now have this society where we acquiesce to the idea that governments can and should know everything that we're doing, um, regardless of whether there's evidence of our wrongdoing. And I think that's why the NYPD is so willing to boast publicly about it and why Microsoft is willing to become associated with it, because it's become normalized. And, and, and of course, you, you go on in the piece to talk about the capacity of drones to also provide this type of, uh, this type of constant and incredibly granular uh, type of surveillance. Now, let me, I mean, do you think, I mean, is what's happening here a, a I mean, I don't know if this is a distinct phenomenon, I mean, because we could also argue that um, this type of surveillance, this extremism, is not the only thing that has become normalized in this day and age. Uh, the idea of a an extended period of 8.2 percent unemployment, in even even in the context in which we uh, sort of undercount employment, would have been well. People would have considered that an emergency uh, 10 years ago, and yet today it is well. As long as I mean, I, you know, I, I sit uh, with uh, you know supposed liberal commentators uh, who say you know th- it really what's important. You know, people aren't going to freak out unless uh, the job numbers start to really go south. But uh, the, the job numbers are already south. We're we're in an emergency here. It, it seems like the new normal. I, I, I guess, is your sense that our society has changed in some way that we accept these new normals, or is that there is a, has there been a, a some type of, of, of change in our capacity to imagine a different situation, or is this something the way it's always been, it's just that perhaps, uh, I don't know, technological advances have sort of uh, outpaced our capacity for outrage? I, I think there are two aspects to it. Um, one is I think that when there are very individualized, discrete instances of elite corruption or failure, um, it's very easy to sort of focus on them, become outraged about them, and to demand that something be done. Um, but when the elite failure and elite corruption is endemic, is just system- systematic and just all-consuming, it's, it, it's very difficult um, to sort of demand that something be done because it's very hard to think about what could be done to arrest these massive, radical, fundamental, you know, degradations in, in your political culture and in your society. It's a much more difficult task to sort of wrap your head around it and, and just start to think about it in a clear way and, and let alone to figure out what can be done. Um, so I think part of it is just that the, the mammothness of it, the way it pervades all of our elite institutions, the, you know, we've seen it with the Iraq war, with, with Katrina, with the financial collapse, with so much of the last decade. It's not just, you know, the Roman Catholic Church. It's not just one institution here and there engaging in discreet, um, problematic behavior. It's really, a, you know, it's what Chris Hayes in his new book calls this crisis of, in, uh, of authority, that all American institutions seem to be collapsing on themselves in a way that, you know, empires always have. But I think the other aspect of it is, is that one of the things that, you know, elites do whenever things seem to start to fall apart is they start to look for ways to protect themselves and fortify their own power and to prevent threats to it. And I think one of the things that we've seen is, you know, this sort of excuse that the that the 9-11 attacks gave to the American government and to the people who own and control it was to paramilitarize um, our police forces to import the kinds of terror tactics that we use against other foreign uh, peoples when we're engaged in a war against them, against our own people, to unleash this massive amount of spending on militarization, increased penalties for um, minor crimes, to allow huge amounts of surveillance and detention powers to be vested in our government, so that there's really this serious intimidation um, factor um, that conveys to citizens, look, even if you are somebody who thinks that you can diagnose the problem and want to take against it, the risk of your doing it is so great, and the probability of your success is so small that it's just best that you accept your own helplessness, your own impotence, and just sort of hope that things don't go too poorly for you and, and there's really nothing else that you can or should do. 
Afghanistan. And I think this kind of fear has been inculcated to a very significant extent in the American public. They fear the government. They fear authority. Um, but they fear what can be done to them, rightfully so, if they engage in meaningful dissent. And um, I think that has been a big part of this acquiescence as well. I mean, I, th- I mean, we we see that we we we've seen that explicitly in terms of the way the police um, uh, have been suppressing uh, dissent uh, via Occupy. I mean, the, you, you can't have a better example. I mean, if, if, if Occupy was the tip of the spear, as it were, um, then, you know, there's no better example of how that movement was pulled apart in many respects by uh, the police. And both both in terms of its direct um, uh, ability to in- intimidate uh, people and also to sort of redirect uh, much of the focus of the of the Occupy movement from protesting what is wrong systemically in this uh, country to having to deal with uh, protesting and focusing on the suppression of that dissent. Yeah, I know. I remember when I went on my book tour um, back in late October, early November of 2011, when the Occupy movement was really at its peak. Um, I was, went around to a bunch of places, you know, in the country. I did a lot of talk radio show, radio talk shows with, with call-ins and the like. And I had so many people say to me things like, you know, when I, because I was hailing the Occupy movement as this really important political development. And I had so many people saying things like, well, you know, I'm a woman, you know, I'm a small baby. And so I, even though I support the Occupy movement so much, I'm afraid to actually go and participate or, you know, a man would say, I'm, you know, I have a uh, disability, I have a bad leg, and I don't feel like I can flee tear gas canisters um, or pepper spray, and then I'm going to be, you know, then I'm at too much risk of my physical safety. People, a lot of people are actually afraid to go and participate in those peaceful protests. I mean, assembling and petitioning the government is a core constitutional right. Lots of people were afraid um, to exercise that right um, because of the the, the, the the show of force. I mean, and basically the police won. Um, and, you know, one of the stories that I, has always struck me um, that I tell a lot is when I first wrote about WikiLeaks a couple of years ago before very many people had heard about it, I wrote about all the reasons why I thought it was such an important and promising tool of transparency, and I encourage people to donate money to it by including, you know, links at the bottom of the piece I wrote to where you can send money via PayPal or Bankwire. And I had... Dozens and dozens of people say to me, you know, in comment sections by email when I would go to other places and speak, you know, look, I support WikiLeaks, but I'm afraid that if I donate money to them, I'm going to end up on a government list somewhere or be accused of aiding and abetting a terrorist organization at some point. Um, and so I just, I, 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 I won't donate money even though I support them. This was a core First Amendment right. I mean, to, so to, to donate money to a group whose political cause you support, which had never been accused of, let alone convicted of a crime, is a core liberty. And yet huge numbers of people have been intimidated out of doing it. And I think, you know, there's so many examples like that, but this crime and the fear is really pervasive and I think causes people to sort of be paralyzed and, and to become passive and, and accepting of even the worst abuses. How how does this sort of this cycle end? Um, I mean, in the in in a non um, you know uh, apocalyptic fashion. Uh, I mean, is there is there is there something that breaks this? I, I mean, I guess it just comes to the point where uh, uh, people have had enough. But it seems to me that it's less likely to happen in the context of our civil liberties and more uh, from an economic perspective, which I think then would, you know, uh, and then you run up with, then you run up, I mean, this is what's essentially happened in many respects with, with the Occupy movement, is that the failure to uh, speak out when we were militarizing our police following 9-11, you know, with LRADs and um, body armors and tanks and whatnot, um, sort of ended up in some respects stifling the dissent about economic policies that were going on in this country. I mean, I, I, how do we, how do we, right. I mean, I think, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, people don't, you know, people don't march into the street and cause massive amounts of unrest over abstract civil liberties violations. Um, especially when there's a perception that those civil liberties violations are confined to a minority, um, you know, which in this case is Muslims. But the way in which these abuses are related to economic um, 
abuses and, and, and the plundering of elites and the like is that the civil liberties abuses are, are implemented as a safeguard on the part of the elite as a weapon to shield themselves from the unrest that they not just think is possible, but think is inevitable from this economic anxiety. I mean, you know, policymakers and planners in the West look to all the um, protests and, and serious amounts of unrest, which are just at the beginning, in places like, you know, Greece and Spain and, and Portugal and even London. Um, and it's only a matter of time before that happens in the United States. I mean, we've seen some of it with the Tea Party movement and Occupy um, and just the general extreme levels of anger and dissatisfaction with American institutions across the board. Um, and so, you know, you've had instances in history where elites and people in power have sought to appease that kind of citizen anger by doing things like engaging in very public acts of charity or um, even the New Deal. Um, you know, if you look at uh, some historians, they, they you know, they, it wasn't like Franklin Roosevelt's age thought it was important to create a social safety net because it was morally um, imperative. It was because they were scared that, that if people didn't, you know, have some safeguard against extreme levels of privation, that they would then revolt. Um, and you see some of this fear now. Um, but, you know, if you look at what happened in the Arab Spring, I mean, power factions don't give up power unless they're forced to. Um, and I do think that that kind of social unrest, that kind of disruption, that kind of fear in the heart of elites will be necessary for any real change to happen. Yeah, I mean, how, I mean, how, how likely do you, do you perceive that uh, here? I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, my, my concern is that, you know, we're... we're that the system is in this country is set up and the expectations of people uh, are set up in such a way that we are extremely vulnerable. And it seems to me more likely uh, to be sort of to, to, to head towards the, you know, the boiling frog scenario rather than, um, you know, some type of, of, of massive crash. Uh, I mean, it, it seems conceivable, of course, that we could have uh, some type of like sort of financial catastrophe. But, um, uh, you know, I think clearly what we've seen, at least from, you know, the, the, the this administration and and probably the, the, the previous one is that when faced with a crash, the key is just to sort of like make sure there's just no crash. Uh, and maybe even take advantage of the new normal, which is going to sort of make it make the dynamic between what is a crash in the future and what the baseline was, you know, that less that much less extreme. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you know, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, but I think that you know, the kind of change that we're talking about is not an either or sort of situation where either you accept the status quo as, you know, the frog in the boiling water before you, you know, it's deep, before you realize it's happening, it's too late, or some kind of massive, you know, violent revolution. I think there's a continuum. Um, so that if, for example, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the level of poverty in the United States and an extreme level of poverty where people literally have no faith in the prospects for the future and the belief that their children can actually build a better life, but where there's, where there's virtually no cost mobility, the kind of poverty that we've seen, you know, and what had always been characterized as, as sort of the third world, if, if those kinds of um, trends continue, um, then, you know, there was, there was a New York art, an article in, in New York Magazine profiling this billionaire, Jeff Green, who's this horrible human being. But one of the things he was saying was, you know, he's trying to get his fellow oligarchs to realize the virtues of paying some more taxes so that you create better social safety nets, because what he's saying is, if we continue to create this class of huge numbers of poor people, um, you know, they're not going to be voting any longer for a Romney or for an Obama. They're going to vote for a Hugo Chavez, you know, what, what he thinks of as a Hugo Chavez. Um, but there's going to be sort of radical changes, even if it's through the electoral system, the rise of, you know, third parties, like you see in Greece, where the far right and the far left are both attracting far more support than they've ever attracted before. So, you know, if you put people in a an intense enough state of deprivation and take away enough hope that things can actually get better for them and instill in them this sense of anger and betrayal of the unfairness of, 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 uh, of the society, you know, historic history proves that they're going to do something, whether it's effective or not, whether it's 
radical or incremental. Those are all, you know, dependent upon lots of factors. Um, but there's going to be a reaction. Um, and I think that our elite class is starting to fear that a little bit, probably not as much as they should or, or it would be good for them to. Um, but I think you can see lots of different outcomes beyond, you know, beyond just everyone's going to suddenly take to the street with arms and, and you know, seize the, the mechanisms of, of labor and, and, and production. Yes. Well, I guess uh, I guess we'll see. Um, and uh, but uh, the 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 point remains is just sort of how uh, you know uh, you know uh, the, there there just seems to be a a a, a numbness amongst uh, the American public. And I, and I wonder to a certain extent, you know, there also seems and and, and I know you're pressed for time, so we just got. But I, I just want to throw this this idea out as well that on some level the. The mechanism for dissent, at least within the context of the system, was always sort of represented by these uh, two, uh, uh, these uh, obviously by th- these two political parties, and it seems like they they're not they, they they sort of are not functioning at all. I mean, in in, in the sense that. Theoretically, you might look uh, to the Democrats to uh, have a have a problem. I mean, theoretically, with uh, things like the Patriot Act, or um, or even I guess you know some libertarian strains on the right. Uh, and it seems that like all the quarters where one would hear dissent about what is going on have been neutralized and sort of absorbed into some uh, a big middle. I mean, you know, I, just uh, yesterday it has been sort of, I guess, selectively leaked by the Obama administration that we are now engaged in some type of arming of, of uh, one side of this, uh, this growing uh, Syrian uh, civil war. And it, the, the idea that that the Obama administration perceives this as valuable, and I assume it's, you know, I, I read it as a political calculation, um, is sort of fascinating because there doesn't seem to be anybody um, who is going to speak up about this being problematic in, in any way. I mean, it doesn't seem there's going to be any debate about this one, so, one way or another, and it's indicative of the, the muting of voices that are traditionally dissenting about these things. Right. I mean, clearly both political parties are serving the same interests. They have some marginal and symbolic differences on a lot of issues. They have real differences on a few issues, mostly of a social um, and cultural nature. Um, but when it comes to economic policy and especially national security and, and terrorism and civil liberties issues, there's very little difference between the two. And I think one of the things that, that the, the, the outcome of that um, you know, it's not just people like you and me who realize that. I mean, Barack Obama, when he was running for president, talked continuously about what he called the widespread pervasive cynicism in the American citizenry, the idea that it doesn't matter who they vote for, it doesn't matter who wins elections, the same forces in Washington continue to have their way. Um, and, 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 and the reason there was such energy behind his candidacy was not because of any specific policy position that he took, but it was because of the vow that he was going to change that. Um, and, you know, just yesterday there was a, there were leaked emails or published emails, um, by one of his top aides in the White House who was meeting with, um, representatives of pharma during the entire healthcare negotiation in secret, you know, purposely meeting in, in diners so that they could avoid detection by not having the names on the White House list, using his personal email account to communicate so that it wouldn't be subject to preservation and disclosure requirements. You know, this whole healthcare bill was, was basically drafted with secret meetings by the very industry lobbyists who the Obama campaign had vowed to combat. And this, you see, replicating itself in, in virtually every realm where it doesn't matter what the outcome of the election is, the same interests are served. And, and what I think that does is it would be one thing if only people who pay close attention to the politics realize that. Um, but for a long time, you know, the, the idea that we select our leaders and that we can therefore choose what policy our government pursues was a, an important means of placating the American citizenry into accepting all sorts of abuses by believing that we're at least free and sovereign and have self-determination. Once people start giving up on the political electoral process as a means of viable change, which people increasingly are, um, then I you know that's when the prospect of more radical movements, um, I think, becomes viable. And in the way that you asked me earlier, do I think it's possible? I think... 
you know, for a long time, the electoral process co-opted lots of political energy. The more people start believing that that political process doesn't offer any real hope of change, the more they're going to look for alternatives. That can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. But it, 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 it's something that, you know, is likely to produce more extreme outcomes one way or the other. Glenn Greenwald, uh, when are you moving over to The Guardian? August 20th is my first day starting there. Okay, so uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, with Salon.com, soon to be at The Guardian. Uh, congratulations on that new gig, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Sam. Always a pleasure.